Good afternoon, everybody. Um, uh, welcome, a warm welcome to our seminar on planes, rockets, and satellites, where things go wrong and what can be done about it. Uh, this is a jointly organised event for the London In International Disputes Week, and I'd like to say, first of all, thank you to HKA, Mayor Brown, and Quadrant for their support in making this happen. Um, secondly, apologies to those who are online. We've had a few glitches uh, with the, the technology, but I hope that's all been sorted out. That if you have any problems, please contact us on the chat and we will uh, try and sort out your problem. The point of focus for today's panel is to be found in the truly rarefied atmosphere, somewhere between the, the normal cruising height of a commercial jet liner and outer space. The first commercial investment seems to be reaching ever higher above the surface of the Earth, beyond the more mature conventional aviation operations, and ever closer, closer to the stars. For entrepreneurs and legal advisors, new issues are arising, and the sum are yet to emerge. One common factor is the aggregation of asset values and associated risks, whether it be two to four billion worth of uh, insured values of uh, conventional aircraft sitting marooned in Russia, or the risks, say, of a collision between satellites. Now, with those issues, I hope we have some, we have some distinct, distinguished panelists to, to guide us today. First of all, it's a, it's a privilege to have Rachel O'Grady, having originally earned her spurs as a deputy counsel at the ICC Court of Arbitration, She's now partnering in the international arbitration practice at Mayor Brown, especially recognised for her for expertise in the outer, outer space sector and co-chair of the firm's space and satellite section. The, direct, the directories rightly recognise her as at ease in complex cases and her clarity of thought. She's in demand as a public commentator on uh, outer space law issues uh, and I believe she's even appeared on BBC Radio. Uh, Alessia Prantiuk is, is a forensic accounting expert, accounting expert in high court litigation as well as investor states and commercial arbitrations in the oil and gas, financial and transportation uh, sectors. As a native Ukrainian and Russian speaker, she's very much in demand at the moment in litigation involving Russian and Eastern European commercial assets. And she has some real life experience of satellite disputes, which I, sh I hope you can share with us uh, cautiously. Anthony Charlton is a chartered accountant with 30 years experience and a distinguished expert witness in international disputes involving complex quantum issues, some exceeding 25 billion, with more than 50 appointments. He's been an, an expert in investment and commercial arbitrations and has testified both in English and French in French and Belgian domestic courts. And he is lauded in the directories as having great analytical skills. Lloyd Watson is happier at, at at least the minimum altitude at which a helicopter can be assured a safe auto rotation. He's an old friend. He was a distinguished Royal Navy pilot, earning the award of Master Air Pilot. After a time as a commercial pilot in civil operations, he took the role of Shell's Air Safety and Assurance Director. He now leads HKA's Aviation and Space Division. Um, he's been in court at least three times, twice with me, very successfully, and he is my expert to go to on fixed wing and rotary piloting, and more broadly in aviation risk management. And earlier last week, we were together on a sanctions panel where he expressed some interesting insights on the operational impact of the Russian sanctions, which if we get time, you may want to ask me a question about. Firstly, I'm going to ask uh, Rachel, uh, could you uh, give us an introduction, please, to the uh, satellite and uh, rocket uh, legal scenario? <laughs> Can. Yes, if I speak this way, will that be okay? The microphone. I think so. Yeah, tell me if you're okay. Good. Um, 
So, um, until relatively recently, nobody even needed to talk about space from a commercial perspective because it was inaccessible to anybody apart from states. And even then, it was only the states that could afford to shoulder a national space program that, that were able to get up there. Now, as you all know, that has totally changed over the last 50 years. Um, now we see commercial, privately owned, privately funded entities and even billionaire individuals um, operating up there and even governments depending on those private entities to implement their own national space policy. So there's been a huge shift in the actors operating in space. There's also been a huge shift in the type of activity being carried out in space. We've moved away from purely exploratory missions to missions in order to generate profit and big amounts of profit, as I'm sure we'll hear. Um, LEO constellations or low Earth orbit constellations, which have been developed relatively recently, now provide super high speed broadband connectivity um, to consumers who are willing to pay a high price for that. Um, but it's not just data services that have been made possible by private operators. There are numerous other initiatives that have been put into place by commercial companies in space. Um, we, you've all heard about space tourism, space mining, power generation in space, um, earth imaging, and, and so on. Um, and the launch providers that are used to get all of that up into space are also operated by private companies. You all know SpaceX is probably the most famous household name. Um, so with that in mind, um, Before you go on, can yeah. I interrupt for a minute? I'm just going to ask Lissy whether she's got any facts and figures which might help illustrate the commercial uh, strength now of this market. Yeah, absolutely. Um, no, I any, any hints. Um, so, just to give you a sense of why you should get excited about this, um, the space economy, the space economy broadly, is anything that happens. On, on Earth or any other planet and anything in between that can benefit human beings. And it's been huge. The amount of investment these days, I think in 2022, was estimated to be around $450 billion. And probably three quarters <laughs> more of that is satellites. And the capacity of satellites changing our lives will touch by new age, but I think there is so much more. So just to give you a sense of, um, the first launch was in 1957. And since then, somewhere between six and a half thousand and eight and a half thousand satellites have been launched. Uh, out of them, roughly half, depending on which source you look at, remain active. Some of them are defence related, but the most exciting part for me is the commercial use, because there will be things like making sure that agriculture companies can make better decisions because of better data, and they can develop yields in a particular way and help longer term beat hunger and shortage of food, which can meet the demands of growing populations. The possibility of mapping temperature and forest deforestation and bringing it together to ensure that we have climate survival. So there's loads of, and huge implications, even from ESG perspective. Um, but generally, I think the commercial side to that as well to be aware of, there's a huge ecosystem of different providers. So there will be companies launching, uh, satellites, as you mentioned, what well, I don't think people understand if you go to space the website and actually get quotes for the size and stuff you want to send, when you expect to do it. And it just gives you a real sense of, you can just get a quote, you can just literally then go and send your satellite for whichever post you want. Alicia, are there any figures for the, the total size of the space economy? Yes, yeah, so uh, as I said before, it will be around <coughs> $460 billion, uh, which means that if satellites alone will be 345 billion which is huge, uh, and that's... Thank you, Lucy. Um, Rachel, sorry to interrupt. So, and by, by 2040, it's actually scheduled to hit a trillion, isn't it, yep. in terms of private investment. So it's growing. Yeah. It's um, a more than 10 times. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so just to give you an overview of the international framework, the legal framework that governs um, human activity in outer space. Now, that was, as, as you may know, put in place in the 1960s. Um, before the shift to commercial 
activity in space has taken place. Um, there are five space treaties that you can see on the slide there. Of them, the Outer Space Treaty of 1967 is basically the one that underpins um, international space law. Uh, so these were all put in place before the commercial space age, when space was still inaccessible, um, and even when government missions were still in their infancy. It was also um, in the middle of the Cold War, so political tensions across the globe were exceptionally high. Um, and the space race between the US and Russia was in its height. So as Alicia said, the first satellite launch ever was by Russia in 1957. So that's only 10 years before the Outer Space Treaty. Um, and then six years before the Outer Space Treaty, Russia put the first man into space. So at this point in time, when the Outer Space Treaty was signed, Russia was winning the space race, and it was the middle of the Cold War. So it was two years before Neil Armstrong walked on the moon. So the main motivation of the nations which signed the Outer Space Treaty was to just preserve the status quo, to prevent land grabs, to prevent sudden claims to sovereignty, um, and to ensure that outer space remains the common heritage of all mankind, um, and also to prevent military operations in space, of course. Um, now, that framework arguably, well, it's definitely outdated, arguably it doesn't work for everything that's now happening in the commercial space age, and this is where I come to the what can go wrong. I've got two what can go wrongs in the time available. So um, first I'd like to look at Article 1 and 2 of the Outer Space Treaty. Article 1, as you can see, states clearly that space is the province of all mankind, essentially what I just said about space belonging to everybody, all nations, without discrimination, um, with free access to all, to all areas. Article 2 then says that outer space, including the moon and other celestial bodies, <coughs> is not subject to national appropriation by claim of sovereignty, by means of use or occupation, or by any other means. And this article has become hugely contested in the context of the modern space age uh, by private commercial entities and ventures. Some have argued that the prohibition against national appropriation doesn't apply to private appropriation, and therefore that this provision doesn't apply to private operations in space. Some have argued that outer space, the first line, outer space including the moon and other celestial bodies, doesn't include resources that are extracted from space, um, and that appropriation applies in the, um, in the more kind of territorial sense. But then there are the traditionalists that have argued that this provision, and combined with Article 1, which we just saw, <coughs> prevents any kind of appropriation by any entity at all. And whatever the right or wrong answer may be, what's clear is that this area is grey and does give rise to diverging interpretations. And in the context of the, the age in which we find ourselves now, this um, can cause, or will likely cause, issues. Um, and gaps remain. So this is my first what can go wrong. There is currently no answer under international law as to who the rightful owner is of any resources that are extracted in space. And this may look very futuristic, but this is already happening. Resources are already being extracted from space by the US, by China, by Japan, notwithstanding the fact that there's no clear um, solution under international law as to uh, the legality behind that. So that's my first what can go wrong. It hasn't gone wrong to a huge extent yet because space mining companies haven't yet properly taken off literally and metaphorically, but um, it, it, it's an area of um, uncertainty. My second what can go wrong relates to liability under the international legal framework. Um, Article 6 of the Outer Space Treaty uh, provides that state parties to the treaty shall bear international responsibility for their national for national activities in outer space. And Article 7 provides that launching states will remain liable for objects launched from their territory that then cause damage to another object in space. So in an era where commercial ventures and private entities are operating in space, it's the states that re remain liable. Question whether that might need to now change. 
um, we saw this kind of come into these issues come into play uh, a couple of years ago in 2021 when um, a Starlink spacecraft apparently flew too close to the Chinese space station, um, triggering all sorts of interesting headlines and questions of international law. Um, so it, it's likely, I mean, nothing happened because it didn't, there was no collision, but it's likely with increasing amounts of space debris that collisions will occur and the launching states may not always be obvious or even identifiable and it may not always be possible to work out which state is responsible for the national activity that caused the damage. So again, it's an area of law which which has gaps in the international framework that currently exists, which needs addressing. If we could go on to ask whether whether anybody's actually buying insurance. Lots of people. For the yes. for the impact of their debris in not, the future. Not for the impact of their debris, but because states remain liable for their nationals. Any national launching from any state will need a license from that state to launch and that the states basically prescribe that insurance is a, is a conditional launch. launch. Yeah. It's a huge market. <laughs> um, right. So that, that was the international legal framework that exists currently, put in place five states, four states, 50 years ago. Since then, there have been some other international agreements set up to found certain organizations, such as the ITU, ESA, um, the International Space Station, and those international agreements also bind their members. Um, and then, of course, you also have the various domestic space laws that have been put into place by each country, well, each space-bearing country, uh, to govern their own national space program and national space activity. And there again, a problem has arisen because each of those domestic laws has incorporated their international obligations into their domestic law framework um, on the basis of different interpretations um, of, the, of the international legal order. So for example, there are certain countries which have passed domestic space laws granting express rights of ownership to their nationals for any resources extracted in space. Um, and that in itself is creating not just um, fragmentation between the different uh, national legislation, but also a potential chasm with international space law. So that's the third what can go wrong. Um, so what can be done? Uh, well, as the commercial space age increases and grows, as with any industry, it's likely that disputes will also to continue to increase and grow. And as a very non-biased arbitration practitioner, um, my solution would be, at the very least, to ensure that a, an adequate dispute resolution framework exists for space activity, um, so that when things do go wrong, because they will, entities operating will have the assurance that they can have a, an appropriate forum in which they can resolve their disputes. Um, I, th I don't think we have time to, to totally overhaul the international legal framework um, before the problems arise, although efforts are being made on a continual basis. Um, and the good news is that lots of fora do already exist, as you know. For, for, for private commercial disputes, we have lots of the world's oldest arbitration institutions are very well placed to, um, to resolve commercial disputes. We also have, in the middle right-hand column, a whole web of investment treaties, as you know, many of which are capable of providing a, an appropriate recourse for private entities against states, if the provisions of the treaty um, can be fulfilled, um, and in at least six cases they have been. And then disputes on the left-hand side between states, of course you have the ICJ, but there is currently no mechanism um, pursuant to which private entities operating in space can bring a claim directly against a state in the event that that state's um, international responsibility is triggered under international space law. So that's a big gap at the moment. And I've written about this, and I have a big um, campaigner for the, for the creation of a new ICSOD convention, so an international centre for the settlement of active space disputes, um, because 
non-existent at the moment, and arguably there's a growing need for one. So and so I thought the structure of that, that is, is it, is it an attempt uh, to create a, a supranational organisation that can speak to a region system or to harmonise the domestic laws relating to uh, space and, and, and rockets? I think the latter is an almost impossible task. Um, I think it has to be the former, and even that's pretty difficult. But when you saw the creation of ICSID, I mean, that was essentially done by a non political organisation at World Bank. So here, perhaps that's the key. I mean, the UN has been um, for years trying to overhaul the international space regime and failing because it's impossible almost to get global consensus. Um, where it might be possible to obtain global consensus is, is on a dispute resolution framework. But if not before the UN, maybe someone. So not a Chicago convention the, uh, the World Bank's time for. Not a, not a Chicago convention from the sky. It's a KO. I'm not going to be able to earn more money from taking over space. I think probably not. Thank you very much for starting us off. Um, I'm going to move to Alicia uh, to talk about some of the um, so, some of the, the, the problems and the, and, the, and the benefits of the of the legal framework, and perhaps give us a few examples. So I'm going to take that in the context of damages bills, okay? Yes. Still no lawyer, I did not get a chance to get my publication in time for this one, but I'll fall back a little bit on Rachel's uh, talk. Um, so similarly, I think damages, um, there's nothing new in the world of the loss, therefore it's always going to be falling back on the existing framework and there is a hypothetical scenario where things work in a way they should versus an actual scenario where something goes wrong. And what the breach looks like, it's one of those um, cases that Rachel touched upon, the case can be framed again around those facts. But what I'm going to talk about, slightly more interesting probably stuff for everyone in the audience, is how that can be adopted to real cases and some of them very hypothetically I've seen uh, or read or have been involved in. Um, so I think we have some good basics, we have good guidance. Um, how we adopt it, that is a big question. Uh, and I think we will have to do so with caution. So I'll give you a hypothetical example one. So if we're looking at a breach of contract case whereby we have the launching company, a hypothetical launching company, and a provider of the load or the satellite in this case. And the satellite in that case would be to deliver internet services. So something we can all engage with um, and imagine in the real world. And the question would become, how do you model the loss? And the questions will be exactly the same. So you're looking at cash first, you're trying to understand what the business does. But then extra questions should be asked. And for me, this is all about business uh, decisions of the company which we as experts have to test. I think there'll be an extra burden on us to make sure the number we come up with is credible. So we're not coming out with another unicorn and in any event it's just more and more unrealistic and every single company could have become the next Microsoft. Just so we are staying with the facts as much as we can. So Alicia, are we imagining a, a, a failed launch of a satellite? Indeed. And, and trying to calculate the, 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 the business loss that might flow from that. What, yeah. what are the problems with that? Uh, well, multiple, I would say, but we would have to see um, what was intended to be done with that satellite. What does the business attached to that satellite use looks like? And we need to understand the market, we need to understand the pricing. For instance, uh, in the internet, you, you can get different packages. So some companies offer upfront costs when you buy equipment and then you pay immediately rental. Some only operate on the rental basis, and they're different pricing models in different markets. You need to understand the competitors, you need to understand all of the things around the business so we can explain and focus properly. But also, what's the life of, of um, a typical um, satellite? Some argue, well, depending on the size as well, so some argue it's between 10 and 15 years. But what something, if something goes wrong, so there's a risk of failure as well, because it's not only just about getting the satellite on the orbit, but also figuring out how to make sure that it sustains its full and useful life. Um, is maintenance available? So it's also a question. So sorry, I just keep throwing questions at you. But the answer is, you do your research, you speak to the client, you get as much documentation as possible. But all of those things will be attacked by the other side because it's highly, highly subjective and because there's not enough information. Um, can I ask a question? Yes. Um, 
so because of the nature of space programs and you know it's not just the launch it's you know, get the building of the satellite and getting the launch and then the orbit and the provision of services but also my clients and um, see the program holistically and they they've already entered into their data provision contracts before the launch has even taken place um because kind of because the way they have to plan so is it not, have you not perhaps encountered more contemporaneous evidence in these sorts of disputes that, that exist just because often in what i've seen they're all they're already prepared and you've already got the contracts that you would have incidents that would be happening to see that and including the kind of the profit that you would earn once they get up there uh, I think that's a really good point, it, and it's to the probably one of my next points around at which stage you are seeing that go wrong, at which stage the companies which asked to launch a satellite, right? Because if they have the documentation, fantastic, it's really good. But what I see probably more of is smaller players who are about to enter market. They see exciting opportunity, they can get funding because investors are opening opportunities and ready to fund it. Um, and would like to seize it, they would like to just enter the space and figure it out. Um, the question is, those, the purpose of those, um, of those forecasts as well, because I'll have to sit down and see whether they were realistic. Uh, and ideally I would want to see industry data, and industry data can be patchy, um, and they may be doing slightly different things, and they may not have the track record I would ideally want to see, to feel comfortable with it, but also some contracts I've seen would only stipulate sales. And why then need to go and figure out the costs to own those sales and to rightly say is they may do them in stages and sometimes they'll have front loaded costs but the revenues will be there so there will be certain elements of where to get comfortable and at each stage for me we have different risks so the original phase can i just ask the two of you perhaps uh, anthony if you, if you has something to add on this is is there any sense of whether there's a change in the pattern of investing in these ventures. You mentioned the more stable investment of a uh, pre-agreed, pre-contracted income stream, no doubt funding a lot of the, the launch and transportation costs. And I suspect that's, the, is that the traditional model? Um, I wouldn't say that income stream will fund it real time, obviously. But no, 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 yeah, but, yeah, but, yeah. but it's uh, it, the, the banks will secure their, their lending against that. Um, Industry, yeah. Yeah. And, 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 and it, 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 to what extent is that changing into an entrepreneurial sort of startup type satellite launch where everybody's hoping that the unicorn will, will emerge? So I think at the moment, in my experience, the, the, the companies that are launching and providing services can only be and are only the big the big names because I mean the I mean each launch I mean it depends who you go with SpaceX is cheaper than others but you know um, every, I mean that's a it's, a relative. It's, it's a relative but even that you know it's about 350 million pounds for one launch I mean and you can only get depending on where you're going to geostation or lower Earth orbit you can only get a certain number of satellites on so if that's not the kind of money that a small player can be dealing with with, with the level of risk which is also involved so that says um, it's very clear that the big players rely very heavily on the startups and, and the innovation that the, the, the small players drive. Um, but what, what I tend to see is then the big one, the big companies coming up and buy them. Um, and there's a huge um, trend of kind of um, consolidation between space companies. But the, the startups and the small operators will also will always exist because they need to because they're the ones that drive the innovation. But at the end of the timeline, it's, what I've seen so far is always a few big players. But I don't know if your experience. Is. I can only talk in really in the context of a case example, but maybe you'll ask me to do it at some point. Well, first of all, we'll come, we'll come back. We'll come back to that. Yes, thank you. That would spoil, spoil that one. Um, yes, thank, thank you. Is that? Um... Oh, I could. I think to carry on, but, um, but I think well, to complement your points, what we've seen sometimes is um, that private companies are quite interested in stepping into space, but also their appetite for risk is quite timid at the moment. So I think the average uh, investment size has dramatically dropped to uh, probably around thirty-three million dollars uh, reported year last year, uh, which is not surprising. Um, however, that means that what do you get for that? Well, <laughs> potentially a unicorn, if you're lucky. 
Um, but effectively, there's a cash injection which is made available to the small enough uh, geniuses who can make, the, make this innovation happen. However, we will all see what happens in the next two, three years, whether they actually succeed. I think I'm going to move to Anthony because you have I think, experience both in conventional aviation and, uh, if that's the right way of describing it, old-fashioned aviation, sorry, Lloyd, um, and in space. So can you... Yeah, indeed, and I think, I think hopefully this will uh, bring together quite a lot of what's been discussed uh, from, from both of you, and, and especially when it comes to, to innovation. Uh, and although it's, it's something quite new, it's quite a few years ago now um, that I was instructed by respondents in an ICC arbitration. Um, and I've got some bullet points here, so excuse me as I look at my paper. But in essence, the dispute concerned um, the claimant's leasing rights of a satellite at a specific orbital uh, position. And it's a location from which uh, various customers uh, household names would broadcast to the UK and other European countries. So there were a lot of channels, TV channels, media channels, and the, um, the respondent had allegedly breached the agreement such that the claimant would lose the ability to broadcast from that defined position. And in order to address damages, the, the claimant's expert uh, had the right starting approach, which was to use a discounted cash flow model. Uh, absolutely standard, that's because you capture the unique unique uh, attributes of that particular project. Um, and he modelled uh, the expected cash flows over the remaining 10 to 15 years of this, um, this leasing. Now, you know, as, as many people who have engaged with damages issues will be aware, a DCF model uh, is only as good as the assumptions and the, the sources on which it's based. And in the context of satellites, quite a few of these issues that we've been discussing come into context. So I'll take you through the way that I critique this, this expert's work. He's not here to defend it, but I think think of this as the general things to think about when you're looking at uh, damages in space and, and in fact, in, in other contexts. Um, the first thing we noticed looking at the, the DCF model was there's no uh, built-in assumed failure rate or failure rates can happen whether it's on launch or even, you know, we, we looked at pictures of space debris, we looked at collisions. Um, these are real things that can happen. If that happens, what are you going to do about it? Back to that into your DCO. That reminds me, I think, of um, my very early days doing personal injury 30 years ago when you were trying to work out the life expectancy of the, of the claimant. And I'm just wondering whether what the what the discount is for the comorbidity of the risk that you're going to be hit by space yeah, uh, debris and I think on a satellite. Yeah, I think various factors you were looking at were between about five and ten percent, uh, which was something close a year. Well, five or ten percent of all satellites. Yeah. It's it's it, we, oh, it, it, uh, absolutely, but that needs to be based again. You know, if you're going to have a failure rate, what is it based on? And there are statistics out there. Uh, continue the. The second thing to look at is um, this model was assuming that everyone would need a uh, satellite uh, for, for broadcasting. But of course, as we know, there are other competing technologies. Uh, there's cable, there's fiber, there's internet. So that has to be factored in. Um, and then a, a third one, which again applies to all sorts of scenarios, is, is basic economic principles. Uh, when you're looking at profit margins, and you look at growth in revenues, two of the most important variables in the model um, the expert's model assumed the expected margin would remain unchanged into perpetuity and there would be an assumed growth rate. That, to me, defies economic laws. Um, it also goes against what technology is all about. Technology is something that is deflationary, meaning that over time uh, the price will tend towards the marginal cost of production. You cannot expect to have outsized profits uh, in the long run. Competitors will come in, you'll have new competition. The model also assumed no change in technology. Um, and I, I'm gonna repeat this guy's name because I love it. Joseph Schumpeter was a uh, Hungarian or Austrian economist, economist who said, you know, over time, new technologies arise, new ways of doing things happen. Look at these beautiful books, and we know that today everything is online and you can search everything. You know that with Kodak film used to be 
printed beautiful pictures and now everything's digitalized. And so it is with satellites, so it is with any technology, things will change. And you have to reflect that in a model. And I'll just say, in, in short, I think it is flawed to assume a very uh, simple static model when you look at damages. Uh, it's, there would be a real benefit from assuming a, a more complex system, a more uh, dynamic system. So, I hope that helps. Can I, can I yes, um, there's one thought that um, came, came out of that. We've obviously all seen the shift from satellite TV to the internet. I mean, it's, I can't go a week without something from Sky telling me how important it's to make the shift. Uh, uh, did you make a prediction in that case about how long the satellite technology would hold its profitability? And were you right? Um, I, I, was, I had a real benefit of working with, um, uh, as I do, and Alessia does on many other cases, an industry expert who could point these things out. We, we really look at things from a damages point of view. We bring economics, accounting, finance, and they talk about things that are happening in the, in the industry. I think that particular expert was correct in, in their predictions. I, 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 you know, I'm naturally skeptical of anything that says, you know, don't expect any change over the next 10 years um, because it's not going to happen. Things will change. Um, and we've just got to apply pre professional skepticism. Before we come back to you in a moment, Anthony, I was going to move over to Lordy to ask mm -hmm. you, perhaps at a slightly lower altitude, <laughs> um, about, about some of your thoughts on operational and safety management yeah, so in the aviation and space field. I think the, as we look at plane rockets and satellites, that, and um, in my perspective as an operator, um, it's all commonly bound by new technology, which is exciting and wonderful and a great future. And you, you know, I, I, I feel really happy about the way things are going. But fundamentally, if you take um, hydrogen engines for greener fixed wing flying, electrical engines for urban air mobility, or um, regional air mobility with electrical engines, or whether it's going to be into the rockets and then the satellites that, that go to space, this, this is broadly new ground, new technology. Um, one of the common areas which history will teach us, and is absolutely fact, and will happen, to all of these technologies is there will be a steep increase in accidents and incidents. And you only have to look at the technology of the airline, of the Comet, uh, and how, how that went. You then have to look at the introduction of the A320, a fly-by-wire aircraft. I mean, there were pilots literally flying this aircraft going, what do you think it's gonna do next? They had no idea. Uh, and so when you introduce this new technology, those, what, what the financial industry commonly call the black swans, are going to rear their ugly heads and we are going to learn from them and we are going to improve. So what's going to happen is that bubble will come back down again. The losses and the, the legal cases will be immense. Uh, what can we do about it? You can actually do something about it. I think that's a really important question. Rather than sit there and think what well, it happened in history, it's going to happen in the future. So it then brings me to mind of a, of a, of a story that happened with a, a major oil and gas company. It's absolutely true, this occurred. They have something like 2,000 vessels at sea at any one moment. Every five minutes, there's a vessel docking in a harbor to offload the, the product. And they discovered, uh, and this is not the oil and gas ones, because every one of these ships is owned by somebody else, they're contractors. But through care and, and the contract, they discovered that there was a serious incident on one of those vessels every single day. So there were 30 serious incidents among over 350 to 400 where people were getting potentially life-changing injuries. And so the oil and gas company with its power set about changing that and it didn't change it by going to the captains or the engineers or the people on the deck. It changed it by going to the people who own the vessels because actually fundamentally it's their problem. They are the leaders of that organization. And the oil and gas company literally taught them how to do safety leadership, which is not pitching up in your vessel in your suit, shaking hands with the captain, having a cup of coffee and going <laughs> back to your office. It's actually putting on the hard hat that Dung was getting down to the oil, meeting the engineers, meeting the deck hands, giving them, giving them that sense that they are part of one family, that their contribution to safety is vitally important. Three years later, and I'd say the marine industry learned this from the aviators, but three years later, they are now down to one serious instance a month. 
Now, statistically, you'll probably tell me what that is. That is a huge change in the, in the, in the middle of how people get hurt and what goes on. And then when I look at all of the accidents that have occurred that I've been involved in, there's a theme of, of the organisation driving the accident and the, le the leadership of that organisation ha having a direct involvement. So if you're going to want to reduce, whether it's going to be the electrical air vehicles or whether it's going to be an increase in profits, uh, uh, the, the amount of accidents and, and incidents that occur that lead to litigation, you've actually got to get after the people, the safety leadership and the human factors. Um, and, and that's where, that's where the aviators, the operators, can really help, whether that's through insurance companies or whether that's through solicitors or lawyers advising clients. I don't think it's going to be wise to go about this without actually drawing the lessons of the past. Well, just, can I just say, I'm not going to give you a statistic, but I will say I used to suffer from being a nervous passenger in a plane. I got over that over time. I've read the books. But every time I sit with Lloyd and we speak, I get nervous. Again. <laughs> <laughs> You'd be no, more nervous on an oil tanker. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, I was, I mean you, you've raised the difference, mm. the historical difference in safety management between the marine industry and, 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 and aviation. What do you think that other industries can learn from aviation in terms of safety management? The treatment of incidents as commodities, as import commodities. Yes. And then what are the lessons that, that, that still have to be rolled out across other industries that you think aviation can help with? Yeah, so I, I would look up, um, I would uh, you know, guide people to look up Scott Chappelle uh, and um, his HVACs, his human factors uh, analysis system. And it's very well laid out. It was originally designed for aviation, but has been adapted by health and rail and nuclear and other areas because there's some critical parts of, of the design of that system which enables organisations to understand their contribution um, at the very top, whether it's by financial or commercial or the stresses that they impose upon their people to get done what needs to be done. Um, but when it's complex, there's also a supervisory level, but again, that supervisory level tends to be human, and humans are prone to make error. And, and then you get down to, so what are those conditions that we as humans suffer from? What are those preconditions? And in the aviation world, it's things like bad weather or fatigue, you know, you can... But they, there's a lot that carry across, not just from the aviation world, but from the experts within that industry. They know their industry well enough to be able to pick out, so these are the preconditions for those human failures. And then, of course, you've got the unsafe acts. You've got the people doing something unsafe. And by and large, they don't mean to, but, but uh, you know, a good example will be uh, a, a hangar, a good team of engineers, well-led. They, they wanted to get the, the aircraft out of the line to fly their passengers. And so this engineer uh, was given the task with a gearbox and didn't have the right tool. So he made himself a tool to get the job done. But unfortunately, the bit that he made fell into the gearbox, which then had to be reported, the gearbox had to be taken off the aircraft, had to be sent off the Airbus, etc. So his can-do attitude cost the company about half a million dollars. Uh, and nobody was hurt, but, but you know, humans will make mistakes. Those preconditions will, will exist out there. And so you need people far cleverer than I am to work out what those conditions are <coughs> and then mitigate them. So that's, that's can, can I ask you about something that's dear to both of our hearts, which yeah. is con controlled flight into terrain? Yep. Uh, and wh when that was recognised as a, a human factors problem, yep. and, and, and what was done about it? What, what technological response? What was there, was there to it? Yeah, so controlled flight into the terrain was the, the biggest on the bar chart. So, what causes uh, an accident and the deaths and an airline come to leave, and it would be the first one there, the control flight train. Now it's the one at the far right. It's been engineered out. And so the technology using satellites, using um, enhanced um, global, uh, you know, enhanced ground proximity warning system with very clever databases of terrain awareness warning systems and very good graphics. If the pilots ever get themselves into a situation where they think they know where they are, but actually they're somewhere else, the electronics will tell them. And so long as they comply with their training, they will not hit the ground. And so controlled flight into terrain has gone right to the very end. Of the and what's the tool, that's, what's the technology that's, that's, that's changed that? Satellites. Satellite and TCAS as well. Yeah, oh, yeah that's, that's collisions with aircraft. 
um, TCAS is Traffic Collision Avoidance System, and that's where you have a computer in two aircraft, they talk to each other, the two computers, and then they tell the pilots where to go to avoid the accident, and it's done vertically, it's not done laterally. So when two airlines come together, it's because air traffic control or some human has made an error, they're not supposed to come together. But now you get two computers that are gonna go, right, we'll resolve this, you go up, I'll go down. And so long as the pilots do that, they will never come together. So that traffic collision avoidance works very well. Uh, and in Shell, I mean, one of the, the things that interests me is that the simulator training started measurably earlier for pilots of aircraft than it did to masters of, of ships. Yes. Is that something that, that Shell uh, rolled out in its... It is actually, yeah. Shell have been a driving force in offshore helicopter safety for a considerable number of years. Uh, and the reason for that is because the regulators, quite rightly, are very interested in the safety of airline flying because there's a lot of people involved. And they are less interested in the regulatory bar that they set for um, helicopter flying, example. But offshore helicopter flying is particularly hostile and particularly dangerous. So in order to raise the safety bar, then um, people like Shell did that through their own standards. Now, their own standards don't mean anything to anybody except through a contract. So if you wanted Shell's money and you wanted to fly with Shell, you flew to those standards within the contract. And similarly, the flying was fine. So. And, and am I right in thinking that Shell and other oil and gas companies were at the forefront of this because they tend to be flying into inhospitable environments where the right. black gold is to be found? It is, yeah. And one thing, you know, we're all proud of the little things we do in our career. Um, when I was the safety director within Shell, I, I then owned this standard and applied it globally. But one of the questions you, I would always ask is, well, why are there different standards? If this is the right standard for this sort of operation, why is not everybody doing it? And uh, the answer to that question is, uh, you know, through the IOGP Air Safety Committee, everybody is now doing it. It's now become an international standard, so it's IOGP 590. So there is no longer really the need for a Shell standard. It is now an international standard. And I think that's a really good thing. Um, I'm going to turn to you last, Anthony, and I think I'm, I'm, I'm just going to ask you whether you can give us, uh, on a slightly different note, one of your experiences from, from lockdown uh, and one of the cases you were involved with, with them. Uh, yeah, I can, and I've got it here. <laughs> <laughs> They've, um, it was a it's not, not, not scripted too much, no. Uh, I have a, it was a dispute where I was again on the respondent side um, between a large aircraft manufacturer that you may have heard of and the liquidator of a bankrupt airline. It uh, concerns a cancelled order, something we see quite a lot, in, particularly in the crisis environment post COVID, etc. So during the lockdowns, the uh, airline industry took on a lot of debt, and there's been a lot of issues around financing. Those, those are increasingly relevant today. And if you add the fact that interest rates are, are going up and you've got a large amount of debt, clearly that becomes uh, even more important. Uh, so this, this particular airline um, had paid 40% of the cost of uh, about 30 passenger jets. They paid that up front to the manufacturer. Um, and that's, that's called pre-delivery <coughs> payments and it's a, it's a very typical way of financing the, the, the working capital. Um, but the fact that this company ordered 30 passenger jets, it was something that the company could ill afford given its financial situation. Um, and the manufacturer proceeded to begin work on the planes. Um, but in the meantime, or a little bit later, the airline actually went bankrupt uh, for numerous reasons, but clearly because of poor financing, uh, because of lockdowns, etc., takeover. Uh, given the situation of a bankruptcy, uh, the manufacturer uh, managed to sell the planes to a different customer. Now, there's a few, there's a few issues that come out of here, um, but bear in mind that what the claimant was claiming was the, the pre-delivery payments uh, back uh, through, through the liquidator. And um, what, what my job was as the quantum expert was to basically compare the amount of pre-delivery payments made to the manufacturer with the costs that the manufacturer had actually incurred, so the work actually performed. Uh, that involved looking at very complex indexation formula to track costs from one, one period to the next. 
and then a number of um, issues arose here that you will see in other uh, situations of cancelled sales. It happens quite a lot, cancelled sales. And one thing is, you know, if you have cancelled sales, are those truly lost sales? If you take a, a manufacturer like uh, Airbus or Boeing, they've literally got thousands of uh, orders that are sitting there that will take years to fulfil. So the question arises, well, is you know, the fact that you've cancelled 30, is that truly, truly a loss or not? Um, there are practical difficulties of obtaining evidence of the cost that the manufacturer has actually incurred. They don't necessarily track things on a plane by plane basis or unit by unit basis. It becomes quite a forensic accounting exercise. Uh, and another thing that you will see, and I think we'll see this in years to come, is the impact of high inflation. Um, in, in these sale contracts for the aircraft, there are very complex indexation formula. Uh, the point being that those formulas were intended to protect the manufacturer from the risk of price increases of, of labour, of raw materials, etc. But the index, uh, indexation formula may not perfectly track inflation in the same way that other indexation formula in different industries, like uh, long, long term supply of gas contracts, has meant there's been, there's been a loss. Um, so I'm going to see, I think we will see many different issues arising from the lockdowns in, in the airline industry. Uh, we, we certainly haven't seen very many of those so far. I think it's, um, we're, we're seeing the cliff effect soon, or rather the, the tip of the iceberg. Yeah, we, we are seeing claims, but it's in a slightly different context. It, it's, the, uh, it's the leases and the financing, which is um, in the problem. So uh, thank you very much, Anthony. We have um, now some time for any questions that people want to ask. We've got really three uh, overlapping areas. First of all, uh, what is going to happen in future about the collision in space between um, private and, and state interests in space? Um, what lessons does aviation, established aviation, hold for the purposes of safety uh, management? And what are, how is it possible uh, on conventional principles to value some of the losses that occur in, in the, the complex network of financial arrangements which sit behind every satellite and rocket launch? So does anybody have any, any questions? Yes. Um, this is more related to sort of the, yeah, sorry. oh, sorry. Um, this is more or less so the governance of the sort of international regime between national authorities and commercial enterprises operating in those jurisdictions. Um, and you've made some maritime comparisons so far, but the one which sort of strikes out to me, um, so in maritime you have the, um, every vessel over a certain size needs to be flagged with a flag state. Um, and then that vessel is accountable to the flag state, but also the flag state is accountable to enforce the rules of operation within that, um, with that flag state. The concern here is that within maritime, there's now been a proliferation of these so-called flags of convenience, where states, rogue states, if you want to refer to them as that, um, essentially operate a very limited oversight of the vessels that are flagged within those jurisdictions. Do you see the risk of that also occurring within this new model as we've described um, within the space industry? That you have a number of countries who are now operating with very limited ability to enforce the rules of these international treaties, but happily grant and rights to commercial enterprises. So there's certainly a degree of forum shopping which is already taking place um, between the main space bearing states. Um, and parties from jurisdictions outside, for example, America, <laughs> are going to the States because that is very um, friendly in terms of the protections that it offers launching, those launching from, from the States. Um, I think at the end of the day, it's a question of how much risk the state itself wants to take and balance that with how much it wants to incentivize new talent and new new operators within the space industry because everyone I mean it's a huge industry and everyone is trying to get a get a kind of piece of the action so to speak. So the UK at the moment is doing a lot to try and promote the UK space industry. But um, yeah it's a balance that the state itself has to 
has to judge, and, and that is in America, for example, the States has done that very successfully because look at what's happening from there. Um, at the end of the day, I think under international law, the, the state itself, will, the launching states, will always bear liability. But um, it, as we saw, if, for example, in a specific scenario, the United States was the launching state, uh, and it caused damage. Some something launched from its territory caused damage to another. Um, let's say let's say it caused damage to a Chinese private spacecraft. The private Chinese spacecraft would still have no um, recourse against the state. So so it's not a question necessarily of the of the launching state enforcing its own regulations. I think and I think states are generally doing that quite effectively, and we see lots lots of cases in the states. Um, before domestic courts, enforcing domestic space law. It's more what happens when we're above that level and there isn't really an answer. And, and um, Can you give us a sense of, uh, finally, Jimmy, I know this, of how many claims there have been against states or against uh, private entities arising out of a, of a, a non-contractual claim, some sort of collision or... One. One. Right. Well, that's so public. it's not easy to build a practice on that at the moment. No, no, <laughs> but, but it, will, it, will, um, it will, it will, I think, can, 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 yeah, yeah. Are, you, are you able to speak? Yes, but, I mean, I wasn't involved. It, okay. was, it was the Russian collision over Canada um, of a, a two, I think it was, yeah, two fellows, but it was settled um, because... Did it, did it, it did, well, proceedings start at some point? Uh, so there was, yes, um, the Liability Convention, which is one of the five space treaties, provides the kind of claims commission process, but it's just between it's just for states, it's not for private and public. So proceedings were launched under that commission, but they were they were settled. And it's the only time that commission's ever been being used. Um, there there are other but but there are other um, examples of commercial space disputes, but they're all at the moment resolved privately before arbitration institutions. Um, yeah, generally but, under contract. Under mm. contract, so, so they're not public. Yeah. Um, but there are some investment treaty cases, some of which are public, um, but, but um, no, on the international plane, yes, there's no, no disputes, no collisions are actually happening yet, but if you look at what's happened, again, we're talking about technology over the last 50 years, it's just inevitable that they are, some, they are going to happen, and at the moment there's no way of Dealing with them. So I, I, I have a question on it. Yes, please do. Oh, uh, only in that I was intrigued in your um, slide that showed the asteroids, the celestial bodies for mankind, and then I'm thinking, I wonder if there's a there is a parallel here on Earth in terms of the minerals that are in international waters and who has access and where to those. Mm -hmm. it's it's, a, yeah, there, there is a big parallel. There's the one that people can draw because common heritage of mankind is also used. In UNCLOS. Um, but the point is that the law of the sea is heavily regulated. Um, you have the five treaties and then the kind of the framework treaty and then the, the final treaty that brought them all together. Um, so it is heavily regulated. In space, there's no equivalent regulation um, is apart from this outdated 1957. Yeah. So logically, does, does what was achieved for those minerals become a framework for what might be achieved in space? That would be, I don't know, bias, I'm passionate about it, but yes, that would be ideal. But the, the problem is, um, and, and you see you see all these um, proposals being moved for the UN every year, they have a working group that just looking at it. The problem is, you cannot get international consensus. There's always, Iran is always complaining, and China and Russia is pretty recent minutes. Um, so, all, no one wants to agree. And equally, the developed space mm -hmm. nations don't want to limit themselves, having advanced so far, so it's almost impossible. I think the law of the sea ma miraculously happened at a time that worked for everyone. And the only kind of parallel in recent times of a truly multinational agreement that where all nations from whatever um, end of the spectrum did come together and agreed on something was the Paris Agreement in the context of climate change. And that was because we were in a really difficult situation. And so what might happen is we'll have to get to that really desperate situation in space before anyone can agree on anything, and hopefully not, but, yeah. I am going to carry the image of you reading the, inter the Iranian delegation submissions. 
on minerals in space away with me. Um, <laughs> very dedicated. Um, any more questions? Yes, down here. Um, I've got a question primarily. Oh, can we just get the microphone to the uh, uh, primarily for Lloyd? So I guess um, how do you incentivize these companies developing the technology to adopt the safety standards? I'm thinking the oil and gas example you used is primarily sort of output companies that are an actual sort of firm. Maybe not everyone will be that way. Yeah, I'd like to think the Virgin Atlantic um, recent launch was incentivized because you only need to get it wrong once. Yeah as a startup company and it's not going to go well for you in the future. Um, but no, I, I, I think that um, certainly in um, technology which is reasonably well advanced like urban air mobility, I know there are a lot of very good safety people embedded within the organisations that are building vehicles. And you know, people like Peter Round, who was the outgoing president of the Royal Aeronautical Society, has got a lot of very good space connections and does a lot of good space work. And so I don't doubt that um, the right people will infiltrate the right organisations. Um, it's, it, it's when it becomes quite uh, you know, easy to do, you know, there's a plethora of it, the costs have come down, and, and you know, we're sometime in the future. Maybe then we'll see less less interest in it. Um, insurance companies, that are, for me, have always been the secret. They're very good at what they do in terms of the brokering and the underwriting and the assessment of the risk. They, I've never been that enamored about how they leverage that position to actually make things safer. No, yes, if the, if the solution is insurance companies, I do, I do wonder about the problem. Um, I mean, I've got a, a partial answer in relation to this. I mean, it's always, I've always noticed the difference between the regulation of aviation and shipping. And I do hope that when it comes to space, we do avoid the phenomenon of disposable companies. Uh, it seems to me that it would be uh, utterly unacceptable for a, a European airline, for example, to be running an, an aircraft operation out of a, a, a Panama brass plate company. And now there's, there's very good reasons in history why, why that is so, and was it so in, 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 in marine, um, in shipping, in the shipping industry. But I, I think it, it's not a great pattern for uh, proper regulation and for safety, the, the encouragement of safety culture in space. There was another question over here. Yeah. It, it seems to me that the biggest problem actually for the space industry is space debris, which I think you touched upon, um, and not actually collisions between um, objects, satellites, uh, and other objects. And there's a lot of, of space out there. Um, and although it is congested, actually, congestion is mostly caused by much smaller, fragmented uh, parts of satellites and present in space. Um, and that leads then on to the question of insurance, which I think is a question that's touched on in a slightly different context. Um, and that is, how important do we think the insurance market is for the survival of the space industry looking forwards? And is it mature enough to be able to cope with these challenges um, in, the, in the foreseeable future? So. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so, as well as the launch insurance industry, um, space debris insurance is a, another new industry. I mean, space is giving rise to all these new industries, but it is another industry that's cropping up and is also giving rise to um, technological um, developments so, and products. So, for example, um, a new product in the market is a, is a it's kind of like a, a monitor of every piece of space debris that, that, and, and it's real time and you can track all these pieces of space debris real time and that, that model is being sold now to insurance companies who are offering um, debris insurance. But the problem is, as you know, um, lots of space debris is under a centimetre big and you know, even a speck of paint smashed a window once in the International Space Station. So it's not always possible, it might, well it might become one day with um, depending on how technology um, advances, but at the moment it's not possible to track debris under a centimetre. Um, so yes, it is, a, It is. I think for the foreseeable future going to heavily depend on the insurance industry and it will play a very large part um, 
Ever this case, I, I do I do ask the question whether that monitoring system can be used to identify the original source of the debris for the purposes of making a claim under Article One. I think back to the nation state who who launched it in the first place. Perhaps <coughs> one day the technology is you know that I don't if you look back at what's happened now, if you if you were there looking at it from fifty years ago, you'd think no way that would never be able to happen. That has happened. So perhaps that will happen in the next fifty years. But I think um, there was a scientist in um from the when nineteen seventies called Donald Kessler and, and the Kessler syndrome is where you know we each piece of debris that collides with another piece of debris in itself generates how many more pieces of debris than they collide, and then they collide, and it will become a point where class like, debris. Is just, <laughs> yeah. So I don't think I don't think opportunity. I would be amazed if that were ever possible. But um, yeah, I think it, what sort of parallel with what Lloyd said earlier is actually um, I think there's a, a large voice in, within the actual companies in the space industry. Um, not to wait for the lawyers to come up with some sort of rules, but they're actually already, you know, these, these big companies that should be competing with each other and that aren't competing with each other, but they're actually coming together to form lots of kind of soft guidelines and laws. And yes, they're not binding, but more and more are signing up to them to, to prevent the creation of further debris. Um, but for what exists already, yes. So, so just sort of a business idea which combines uh, your computer uh, idea of planes coming up and down. And the vessels at the sea and the sea collecting plastic garbage. Could you have something going through space, going up and down, and be guided by computer to collect all this uh, trash? Well, there's, there's loads on, of on every, money. On every other Tuesday, on the There's lots of uh, money actually, and yeah. private, private equity houses are investing in yeah. cleanup okay. technology yeah. into space, yeah. like that. Oh, yeah. ranging it's, from it's kind of big goes. nets going from, from satellites to um, you know things to pull debris down to be burned back in the atmosphere. So there's, there's, yeah. And is there any legislation now? I mean, China did a test and blew a satellite up. Is it, can that happen again? Yes. There are no international regulations. The UN has now adopted um, some guidance, but there's no international binding regulations around satellite national technology. It's terrible. Yeah. 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 I mean, the original question was about um, about insurance, and uh, <laughs> I, I do. Um, uh, one of the dangers of, of, of with insurance is the way it matures. I mean, it's it's a, potentially it's an attractive market at the moment for insurance because there aren't any claims, by and large, not turning up for collisions. So it's, they're very happy in this at the, at the start of this sort of market, as they were with data breaches and, and, and cyber insurance, to take a small amount of premium, uh, believing that they're never going to have to pay a claim. What then happens, I'm afraid, is that a serious claim comes in at some point, and, and the capacity disappears for one. Um, and I do fear that, that we should we should not rely on insurance for for the development of safety and safety culture in, in in space, at least not in the early stages. Yeah, and actually I think I was a, to an extent of a part of my question, because there have been some very large claims. Um, there have been some very large claims recently, um, in relation to launch failures in particular, they just seem to be in various others. Um, and whether that has had an impact on the insurance market, very well so give, which is if there is a big claim, does everyone soften up? Does that then have, have, have an impact on the development over the next the foreseeable future? Because you can't get insurance. Or is it just anti capital that's going to bring, keep this going through the billionaire investment that I think uh, Rachel was talking about in the, in the, uh, the beginning? I, I don't know whether these experimental launches are actually insured, I suspect. I mean, it was Virgin. I suspect it wasn't. No. It wasn't. So it, it, it's the more mature satellite launches, um, which I, I think are insured. Um, so again, I mean that's a, that's a that's another example of how perhaps sometimes the, the insurance market is reactive rather than um, supportive um, for its own reasons, shareholders. Um, you know, we, we've seen, for example, in, in cyber insurance, how for about a decade. Premiums were taken with, with no claims, and then suddenly British Airways um, has one of the largest data breaches um, ever. And the market, the capacity uh, in the market disappeared. Well, well, thank you very much indeed. I think that's probably all we have time for. Can I say a, a wonderful thank you to, my, to our, our panelists?
um, it's rare to have this combination of, of skills and experience uh, speaking together. I know they've done a lot of work uh, and it shows. So can you can you please thank them 